Hello, everybody, and thank you for listening once again to Devil's Been Talking Radio. We've got Mark Sargent on today to talk to us about different aspects. You know, I, I want to say the hollow earth, although I feel like the interview, it probably will not go that way. <laughs> But I, I wanted to give you guys a fair opportunity to uh, know that before we talk about today's uh, subjects. But we have Mr. Sargent on because of the fact that he was the very first um, guest that we interviewed on Devil's Been Talking Radio. So it is definitely for Chuck and I an awesome opportunity to have a, have a guest on who, uh, for all intents and intense and purposes gave us a shot so how you doing mr mark Sargent? you know i can't complain i've been pretty busy the last oh, three or four months but uh everything's everything's going great in the flat earth slash hollow earth slash whatever else you want to talk about community well and we and when i when i sent you a message when I left a message for you on your phone, mm -hmm. which you were so gracious to call me back, by the <laughs> way, and, and I know that because you are a busy guy, so you have to listen to every message on your phone. I do. <laughs> I, I physically do. I listen to every single message on my phone. Luckily for me, you know, we're, we're rolling into another generation of people that don't call. So I was lucky, you know, because I put my phone numbers out there everywhere. Anybody can call my phone. But I, I listen. I Yeah, I literally listen to. And I don't go like if somebody leaves me a six minute message, I probably won't listen to all six minutes of it. But I <laughs> but I do literally sit there and listen to every message. And I go through texts, even though I've never sent, sent a text before in my life. And I never will. Uh, I still go through the text and look those and, and, you know, but I don't respond if it's important enough in a text and, you know, cause you can click on info and find out the phone number. I will call them based on their text, but I won't text Which, back. Which, by the way, I do not mean to interrupt you for Sorry. all of you listening. Mr. Sergeant actually called me back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't mind. I love, I, I grew up doing all my, most of my career was doing, support via phone you know old school stuff i'm old i'm older i should say and so i spent a lot i mean thousands and thousands of hours on the phone and that's my preferred method of communication but besides face to face so when when texting came out i understood it because it's the um the sun Tzu art of war quote which is people will always take the path right. of least resistance and people it's easier Let's face it, texting is easier than picking the phone up and talking to somebody. And if you if you cut your teeth on that, meaning if you, you know, it's easier to ask a girl on a date via text, which it is, then that's what you're going to continue on doing. But I I think we've we've taken a, a big step backwards in that in that aspect. Anyway, that's that's just me rambling. So, what what do you got? What are we talking about? What are we doing? There is no rambling when it comes to our guests. However, mm -hmm. I do want to ask my homie here, my co-host, the guy who would make it impossible for me to do this show, who is currently shining a photo in my face right now. Chuck, you got anything for me here, buddy? For what, about the topic today? Yes. Oh, I mean, it's going to be an interesting interview because it's always good in information that Mark always sort of shares with us so get you thinking <laughs> absolutely um so uh we've we, i had i brought you on originally for a very interesting topic mm -hmm. um however in the meantime uh how did the i believe you had a convention going on um in conjunction with the solar eclipse that we had on the 21st, is well, that correct? Well, I actually went to a biblical flat earth conference that was down in Atlanta just before the, the eclipse, and that was between Zen Garcia. That was a debate uh, between Zen, oh, Gar wow. yeah, Zen Garcia and uh, Dr. Stephen Pigeon. It was basically uh, chapter and verse versus chapter and verse. You know, just opening up the Bible and, and going at it, and and seeing who comes up, who's who comes out on top in terms of flat Earth. And I wanted to be there to kind of see what the other side brought to the table. I know what science brings to the table in the secular world, but I wanted to see the religious angle because, as you know, there's a lot of religious people out there. Absolutely. And there's a lot of flat Earthers that are in in that camp, and so I wanted to see how the fight was going there. And and yeah, we're mopping them up because 
Look, that in my opinion, and I'm okay, not the only. So go ahead. So, and, and you're a very courteous guy, by the way. Thanks. So forgive me for interrupting you. That's right. Um, what do we mean by you were mopping them up? Oh, oh, meaning the the biblical debate goes about the same as the uh, secular debate, which means there's everybody on the on the flatter side knows or, or or at least has strong strong beliefs that the the bible and all the other versions of the bible are, are it's basically a flat earth book but when people the the people on the other side try to go against it they really try to pick just one or two points and it really comes down to a dissection of the interpretation of phrases you know breaking it down to the raw hebrew and then it's okay well it could mean this and it could mean that but look, I mean, most of the audience I'm sitting with had, knows very little Hebrew, if any. And so he lost them. It, it, kind of like when mainstream science tries to attack Flat Earth and their default stance is mathematics. And I keep trying to tell them, going, look, if you open with... And I know, I get it, nerds, super nerds are heavy, heavy math based. That's, that's how they're wired. But if you try to come at Flat Earth using math you are going to lose 90% of your audience right away. Because as you know, right. as we went through high school, there was pre-algebra, there was algebra, there was um, uh, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus, in that order, usually. And m most of the people didn't even make it to geometry. You were, you're lucky. You, you were considered kind of brainy. If you made it to trig, then you were probably in math and chess club. And if you made it to calculus, you were probably a nominee for valedictorian. So... Most of the audience isn't one of those people, and I knew this going in because when we bring up the 8 inches per mile squared formula, which is supposedly the curvature of the Earth, I've seen way too many people gloss over, just gl their eyes get all glazed, because they don't remember algebra. And that's just basic, basic algebra, you know, eight, you know, it, but just take a number and square it. A lot of people don't even remember how to do that. I mean, a lot of high what do we, what does anybody remember from, from high school? Generally nothing. So... Anyway, that, that was my point. So this, I was basically watching the equivalent of that from a biblical standpoint, where they were breaking down verses of the Bible into the, the raw Hebrew and then trying to take it from there. I'm going, well, one, I'm lost. And if I'm lost, I guarantee you most of the people behind me are lost. So anyway, that was the Atlanta thing. The eclipse thing, though, which was very interesting, that was a whole nother... Which is what... Which is what um, our guests wanted. I've actually got a load full of questions sure. from guests to ask you. And the first one would be, um, you were talking about the eclipse. Yeah. Um, I, wanna, I want to go back to, um, in your opinion, right. did the biblical explanation went out to you or did the and I'm sure neither one won out to you, but did the biblical or the quote unquote um, uh, secular secular yeah secular well uh, I'm, which which one was closer to you in your opinion of the two? I'm kind of a hybrid because I was raised in a in a strong born again Christian home, so when I got into this, I was when I went to college, I fell away from the church, but Flat Earth brought me back. Meaning my, oh, wow. my really? okay. oh yeah, my faith was severely reinforced by the flat earth because once you start looking on, on at, at how it was built, eventually, and I say that eventually, it does not take long though, eventually you get to the point where it's like, okay, it was built this way and then it clicks in. It's like, well, if it was built, you know, rather than just some cosmic accident flying through space, then there was a builder, hence a creator, hence potentially the handprint of God. Now, am I saying that this stru particular structure was built exclusively by the divine? Eh, maybe, but at it, it, the very least, we're, we're one step closer to that. So that for me, it's, it's both. In fact, I, I, the, my website enclosedworld.com leans towards the... I, when people say, you know, do you believe in flat earth? I go, no, I don't just believe in flat earth. I believe it's enclosed. And part of the reason why I chose enclosed is because most of the religious texts go into an enclosed structure, hence the firmament. You know, the, the whole thing from Genesis 1, 6, I believe. You know, the, wa the, uh, the barrier separating the waters above and the waters below. And the, the whole Rob Skiba website, uh, testingtheglobe.com, where he goes in, he breaks down literally every chapter and verse in Old and New Testament and says, look, it's, it's flat. He goes, it's flat, it's enclosed, it's a big building, it's a structure, it could be God's footstool for all we know. 
but it's definitely not some organic little ball that's just flying through space haphazardly and could get wiped out at any second. So for me, that for me, the the relig the the secular side brought me back into the religious side. If that answers the question more briefly. So okay, so uh, what you're saying is that the whole flat Earth and the whole um, enclosed world system, mm -hmm. which by the way, for you, the, for those of you who are listening, I was actually on there today. You can find that at www.enclosed.com. Dot com. Um, actually, I was at that site today, and it offers some pretty awesome information. Um, but what you're saying, and, and you know, our show is not necessarily about trying to uh, bring our guests to Christ per se. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that, and we definitely want to bring as many of our guests to Christ and to the church, and we want them to have a religious experience um if possible which we would definitely thank jesus for mm -hmm. but what, what you're saying is that um the actual enclosed and um, flat earth theory itself mm -hmm. got you to investigate the bible and to investigate the claims of the bible and to investigate the whole enclosed theory because it matched up with your point of view is that correct oh yeah yeah you can't and i have yet to find one you are going to be hard pressed to be a flat earther and an atheist it's just not going to work you can be an atheist and a globalist but to do that with a flat model i i don't see how you're going to pull it off it's too deliberate the the mechanics are far too deliberate far too complex and far too elegant in my opinion so no it's uh you you can't yeah the, the the flat earth is going to bring you and has brought so many people which is why uh this community just keeps growing bigger and bigger because of its spiritual side amen chuck you got anything bro not right at the moment so i apologize <laughs> about that okay so. so we want to investigate the hollow earth theory sure. and we want to talk about that and that's what i originally um, I, want, I had contacted you about, and mm -hmm. then you had talked about the whole um, the whole uh, eclipse um, phenomenon, right. which we do, we definitely do want to get to that. Okay. Um, but I have a friend of mine who is a listener of yours. His name is Benny, mm -hmm. and Benny, if you're out there and listening to our show. Yes, I am talking about your questions and your ideas. <laughs> um, but he um, he wanted me, number one, have you heard of a guy named Jaron? <laughs> Jaron Campanella? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I know him. <laughs> He he actually wanted me to uh, ask you if you heard if you had heard of Jaronism. Oh yes, I have spoken to Jaron Jaron many times. As a matter of fact, Jaron likes uh, telling the story about how I got him into flat Earth. He uh, he he watched some of my videos and realized right away what I was using to make my videos with, and so he went to like a secondhand store and bought like Visual Studio twelve for like four dollars. And he basically, his logic was, well, if that guy can make can make videos on YouTube and make them do well, I can certainly do it. And he became a, a big flat earther, and and now he's he, in fact we we've got a show on the same network, and yeah, it's great. I like Jaron, and his <laughs> and his lovely and his lovely wife Missa. Okay, awesome. Well, there you go, Benny. Um, he had three other questions so here's the first one all right have you ever looked into the possibility of the earth being made not the earth but the uh moon being made of celestine his um his whole proposition behind that is that um okay so me and you and chuck have talked about how the earth um has some sort of special principle behind it where um it has something to do with reflecting some sort of light, if not the sun's, than its own. And he's saying that um, he's asking the question if we've ever looked into it being made of Celestine, which when it comes to cold light, which we talked about on our past show, right. of um, 
the earth, the uh, moon have its own property where when you magnify it with a magnifying glass, the light coming through it will be colder than right. the light being. Yeah, so you already know all about that. Yep. But his question was, have you ever heard of it being made of Celestine where it, we reflect all of the properties that we have now, um, but instead of um, having to resolve all the issues of a um, of a global earth it will actually reflect all of the properties that a global earth would allow it to have but because it's made of celestine it will, will reflect all the properties of a global earth on a flat earth scale so have you heard of that no, but I but I like it, and it wouldn't surprise you. Remember, because okay, people have, have suggested over the last couple of years you know, that you know who, why, why, how would this deception, how would this trick be pulled off? Because it's not like man is doing it, right? We didn't even know until the mid nineteen fifties for sure what was going on. And I said, well, the creators, whoever built this place, made those sort of illusions. You know, you still have to simulate a globe. In fact, you have to put the idea into people's head 500 years ago that, that it is a globe. And by that, I mean the star systems, <clears throat> the, the waxing and waning crescents of the moon, even the eclipse, which you'll get to. Uh, but yeah, what, what, what he's talking about there, about how the, the moon, basically saying that the moon's properties are simulating what it would be on a globe, but it compensating in a flat Earth model. Yeah, yeah, sure. That, that's okay. exactly what we, we, so, we'd want that. Another question. Go ahead. Uh, and 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 I t and I told him I was like I'm pretty sure he'll have an answer for you, but I'll ask anyway. Sure. Um, he also wanted to ask, other than holograms or a separate invisible, and these are questions coming right from this guy. So, mm -hmm. other than holograms or a separate invisible circular body, can you explain a way that lunar eclipses work on a flat Earth? And this is kind of that that kind of comes back around to our shows i know that you um were you weren't able to make our last show because of the fact that you were i believe there was a conference going on with flat earth right i've been um, i've been jumping around quite a bit uh so he he wanted to know other than holograms or a separate invisible circular body can you explain a way that lunar eclipses work on a flat Earth? That was his question. A lunar eclipse on a flat Earth works no differently. And again, we'll get into this. I, I tr I'll try not to expand on it too much. Works no differently than it would in a planetarium. The only... And he's talking about a lunar eclipse, not a solar eclipse, right? That's what he said? Yeah, he said lunar. Okay, perfect. Which, which is re really just a blood moon. And it's just a display property. When you go in, and I know, again, uh, people don't go to planetariums like they used to do in the old days. I mean, if, you have, if you're of any age, you remember that during the week, the planetarium would just be a planetarium. And on the weekends, they turn it into like laser Led Zeppelin or laser Floyd or something like that. And just display whatever you want on the screen. And I, I mentioned that because, look, when it comes to a planetarium, when it comes to the ceiling, they can display, especially with the tech we have now, they can display anything they want. If you want your name spelled out in stars, if you want your face put on a mo on the moon, uh, if you can do, basically the only thing they can't do in a planetarium because, well, they're getting closer because of the light sources, they can't simulate the sun very well because it's got to be a really, really, really bright light source and it's going to generate a ton of heat. But when it comes to the moon, it's easy. I mean, the, the moon doesn't even have a hundredth of the, illumina um, the luminosity that the sun does. So when it comes to turning the moon red, you just turn it red. Uh, same thing with the waxing and waning crescents uh, or anything when it, when it comes to the moon. All, all phases of the moon and the colors of the moon are just uh, setting. That's that's all it is. So turning the moon blood red, I mean, literally, it might, they could turn it blue, they could turn it green. It doesn't make any difference. It's just a color. So that's that's all it is. It's literally, and the reason why I mention it, I say, and I, I kind of downplay it, I say it's simple, is because in a planetarium, in an enclosed system, it's simple. If you're not using a dome, if you're not using a firmament, it gets a lot trickier. You're dancing around a lot of other issues, which is why the firmament, from what I can tell, is still skewing 75%, 25%, you know, dome or no dome. And so that, that's my answer. It, you, it's in a dome. It's, it's, the planet, it's just a planetarium setting. 
It is as easy as that. God is a, not only is he a master builder, he's also a master programmer. And programming the moon to be red, pfft, snap. Peace cake. <laughs> um, okay, and and we do have um, other questions more going with the topics that we've um, briefed in the past. Mm -hmm. He had one more question, and uh, this is my good friend, so that's the reason why I'm taking time to ask them. Mm -hmm. But he asked, have you ever looked closely at the correlation between Martin Luther, Copernicus, and the Pope? And, and what he meant by that was, um, for example, uh, Martin Luther and Copernicus got in a huge uh, debate about this, uh, whether the earth was round or whether it was flat and the whole heliocentric thing. And then the Pope back in Copernicus versus um, Martin Luther. Have you, had you ever looked into that? Did you have any facts about that? Or do you have any? Any other facts that closely resemble these facts that you wanted to discuss versus um, these ideas? Uh, I don't. I didn't really look into the correlation of those guys, only because you got to remember that 500 years ago, when Copernicus was doing his thing, it benefited the creator, or creators, or builders, or whatever you want to call them. It benefited them to get the idea out there. So don't think for a second that mankind invented up invented the heliocentric model on on, it, on their own. They did not. They were coaxed. They were pushed. Somebody gave them the rough sketches, and they fleshed them out from there. And even then, they were scared to death of it because it implied you know this vast, scary, you know, lonely universe. Copernicus, Copernicus himself. If you believe the historical records, and I sort of do, you know, didn't even, he made sure it was not published until after he died. That was part of his will and testament, which was don't publish this thing until I am in the ground because I will catch a lot of hell for it. And he was right. You know, the heliocentric model was a, uh, was a massive leap of faith. So whatever was where was going on back then between the Vatican and Copernicus and all the other people, nothing, nothing would surprise me, but I haven't really focused on it because... Over, you know, because in the, the bigger picture is is that whoever built this place put the idea into man into our civilization deliberately to hide the fence and it took a while before it propagated but once it did it was perfect and it held on for a long time up until just about now awesome Chuck you got anything well, uh, you're kind of saying that uh, a lot of the world's governments are helping to hide the fence like you're just saying, right? At, at the highest level, yes. But yeah, you don't yeah. have to have that many people to do it. Because a lot of be people come to me and said, oh, my God, the organizations that would have to be involved would be all the pilots and all the scientists and all the astronomers and all the astrophysicists. I'm going, no, no, no. It's none of those people. Nobody. Yeah. I mean, this with this, it's, it's not like the Manhattan Project where you were refining nuclear material. Sure. This is this is something where less is more. And I treat it like the Capricorn 1 movie from 1979. If you guys ever get a chance, check out Capricorn 1. Brilliant independent film from 1979 where they were faking the Mars mission. Which is everybody involved in that project. Every wrench turner, everybody that did the fuel, everybody that built the rocket and did all the, the, the nuts and bolts. They didn't know jack about anything. The only people that need to know are the people at the very, very top and the telemetry guys. And by that, I mean the software telemetry guys nowadays. Back then, 1979, there wasn't a lot of software. But now, you would, you would just have some developers that would know, you know and, and make sure that, you know, you could trust them, of course, but you'd monitor all their emails and phone calls and, and if they got out of line even for a second, which is what they talked about in Capricorn 1. There was this weird scene where one of the, one of the telemetry guys, something was wrong. He, he's going, no, the, the data's not right. He's going... He he goes he goes we're broadcast the broadcast is coming from Earth you know it doesn't you know it's like it's almost like the, the they never went to Mars, and the second he even hinted that to one of his friends who happened to be a reporter he disappeared in that from that movie and he was erased from existence his apartment was vacated another person was put there all the magazine stickers matched it was literally like he never was born in the first place. And that's what we're kind of talking about here, where you compartmentalize everything, make sure that only the tippy top people and people you can trust, but even the people you can trust, 
you absolutely put tails on them for, for every stretch, every astrophys, not every astrophysicist, but people that are working in like, um, with radio telescopes, you'd monitor all their traffic. Sort of like, um, do you remember Chuck, the, the movie, uh, you probably do deep impact from some years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For sure. R remember the beginning of that where the guy, uh, where Frodo sends the, the message to the astronomer and he looks it up. And I say Frodo because I can't remember his name uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure his name's not Frodo. Elijah Wood. <laughs> Elijah Wood. So he sends that message to the astronomer, and the astronomer is looking. He sends this email off, and then he gets in his Jeep, and the Jeep crashes. And it's completely legit. He crashes off the road. He was so excited, and, and, he, and he dies. Well, the thing was... Hadn't he died, that was just a convenient, that's convenient writing, because hadn't he died, run off the road and died, the government would have gotten to him anyway, and, you know, threatened him one way or the other and said, okay, this email that, you know, this asteroid that you see, yeah, we're not going to talk about this with anybody. They, you know, they monitor, they monitor certain things. I'm sorry, this is a long answer to what you were saying, but we're talking about a very small amount of people that know it, like the president of the United States, for example. And, and somebody was joking with me the other day. And he goes, does, does he have to know? I go, does he, does he have to know? I mean, we're talking about a, the front man, you know, just a, he's just a band leader in some ways, you know, he doesn't have to know anything. The only president of uh, the last president of any real power in our country was Dwight D Eisenhower. And the only reason he had that power is because he was a five-star general because he ran literally the entire our side of the world of world war ii so he was above Patton and above um macarthur those guys you know those those guys that he was their boss so everybody after eisenhower you don't have to tell them anything you can kind of hint about this and that but for the most part they just read what's on the teleprompter and they don't have they it's really above their pay grade that's the end of my little speech <laughs> Sorry. That's why, Chuck. I guess uh, why I was asking that. So, why would they choose to keep everybody else in the dark about that? Oh my God, that is such a good question. Because, and I get that question probably one one out of every ten emails or phone calls or texts. Sure. Which is that you know why 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 would they hide it? Why would you hide it? It's like okay, it's the it's the potential shock waves. What I have learned over my many years is that the authority and i call the authority you know they're just a, a the, the the highest powers right and, you know this the the scary men in the in the long table that are smoking in the dark they don't take chances they do not leave anything to chance they they have contingency plans and then backup plans for that and then fail safes for that when it comes to this the shock waves of potentially letting this thing out without getting the story straight are catastrophic Meaning, uh, we'll, we'll take a quick, quick look at three three groups. One would be academic. Uh, astroph you know, let's say the UN, all of a sudden, it, it was released by the UN tomorrow that the Earth was actually flat. Or it was enclosed, or whatever you want to call it. The academic community, uh, that's the smallest of the shockwaves, would be turned upside down overnight. Astrophysics and astronomy, they would shutter their doors. They would literally not open in the morning. The remaining physical sciences, uh, geography, geology, hydrology, biology, hey, basically any ology, any physical science, they have to retool. They got to burn, I shouldn't say burn their books. They've got to throw away their books and then re retool them. Basically, everybody has to rewrite every textbook. The Okay, let's uh, economic. You would have to close down the stock markets for at least a month. And we're talking all world markets because of the potential, because of the volatility that would happen, because of all the industries that are tied to the world, meaning the, the perfect example would be the defense industries. You, you, huge amounts of money, ma massive amounts of money are tied to defense industries for, you know, especially in the United States really really big do countries still go to war if you are now inside a big terrarium are you still gonna fire missiles of this of those people because now the game's changed now you're not some random piece and now there may be another player at work you know now it really honestly you're gonna have to start looking over your shoulder and then that is tied to the biggest ripple of all which is spirituality spirituality so oh, i can't even it's profoundly changed meaning 80% of the, the people in this world are tied to a, a religion in, in one capacity or another. All of them have been looking for the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, some sort of fingerprint of God, intelligent design, whatever you want to call it. 
you're basically giving all of them simultaneously what they want. And what they want is a way to even the playing field against science. And that is a x extremely volatile thing. Meaning, yeah, you could say, well, it's 2017. It's not like the churches are going to go out there and grab pitchforks and torches and just start, you know, running into universities and burning things down and, and killing everybody with a lab coat. No, it's probably not going to happen. But are you going to take that chance? Because science has been beating the heads of religion for the last 500 years. And it's gotten worse every decade. So between those three things that I just mentioned, the, the meeting between, you know, the, the meeting of the scary smoking men, that meeting's about 10 minutes long. I mean, it's like, you know, they, it's like, well, you know, somebody opens up, well, what's the worst that could happen, right? You know, big drag off a cigarette. And then somebody lays in what I just said. And then pretty much you just wait for the table to go, okay, we're going to keep this thing secret for as long as humanly possible. And so it doesn't matter. Money is not an issue in this case. And again, then what they did was bigger than money. You locked down Antarctica, even though the resources could have netted you billions, <laughs> billions of dollars. And you say, we don't care about the billions of dollars. How there are very, very few conspiracies. There's only like two or three that I can think of that are bigger than money. And this is one of them. So yeah, that's why, that's why they're going to hide it. Now, does that mean they're going to hide it forever? No. No, not at all. Because this is like, you can't hide this thing forever. It's like hiding something from your roommate. Like, a, let's say your roommate smokes. Trying to hide a pack of cigarettes from him in the apartment somewhere. You can shuffle it around here and there, but sooner or later, he's going to find it. The apartment's only that, it, it's only so big. That's what we're talking about here. So what they did was, and it's very, very clever what they did. They built a massive technological infrastructure. It was the only part of the future they ever, you know, they gave us, you know, they didn't give us flying cars or ray guns or teleportation or cloning device. Well, a little bit of cloning, but you know, not instant cloning. But at the same time, what they were doing was instead of giving us all those cool things, what they did was they built this massive information network and they're going, wow. Yeah, it's great. Right. People can talk to each other and text little emojis to each other. And yeah, it's very, very productive. That's not what it's for. It's there so that when the time comes, everybody can get their story straight. You know, the old criminal thing, you know, all five guys just got busted. It's like, okay, here's the story. With a, with a, you, you, you build the network, you build high speed internet, you install social media and then layer upon layer upon layer of social media and make sure everybody's got, uh, you know, the devices that are tied to it. Really, really good devices nowadays. I mean, smartphones are about as good as they're going to get, in my opinion. Therefore, then when it happens, you can broadcast, you can spin it the way you want and everybody gets your version of it that the way you spin it in what minutes, what would have taken days now takes minutes. That's okay. Anyway, sorry. That's my little. No, no, no. And, and don't feel bad for sharing so much. Um, I did want to ask for the sake of our listeners. Um, what kind of effect does the eclipse that happened on the 21st, what does that have upon the idea of flat earth? Oh, it did nothing but help us. In fact, it's, it's our flat earth. It's, it's our, the, the, the eclipse is a flat earth eclipse in my opinion, and you can ask anybody in the Flyers community, the, the globalists, so? uh, because for, for a couple of reasons, and, and let me, let me preface this with, I got to actually go down and see the blackout, uh, in the, the, one of the most beautiful settings ever, which was at Riverside Park down at ground zero in Salem, Oregon. There was a documentary team from Los Angeles that flew up to Seattle. And then we drove down, we took a couple cars and drove down to Salem and we stayed uh, actually in Newburgh, Oregon, which was just to the northwest of Salem, drove down there. And, and people, you know, the media was really hyping this thing up, saying that, oh, you know, Salem's going to be overrun. There's going to be a million people. But no, it turned out the exact opposite because of social media, because people looked it up, saw the horrible potential stories of what was going to happen in Salem. And since the blackout path was 70 miles wide, you know, which is still pretty big. They just went anywhere they could inside the blackout path because there's lots of roads. So yeah, there was a lot, a lot of people that came in from Seattle and surrounding areas into the blackout path in Oregon and all the other cities along that path. But they didn't have to, you didn't have to concentrate in one area. So I was in uh, literally this wonderful park on this river and there was no media in my zone except for us. 
and it was a beautiful, beautiful morning. It ended up being like a 90 degree day. And it was stunning. Anyone out there, you just don't, I, I, I was completely mistaken. I thought that a 70% eclipse or an 80% eclipse was going to be kind of cool. No, until you get to that final 3%, you know, 98, 99, and 100. Oh, when it hits, in fact, when it hits 99, it starts turning, turning magical because it's just this little spotlight that's shining right down on you. And then it, when it, when it goes totally blackout, it's one of the coolest feelings ever. I mean, the crowd immediately, there, yeah, there were some cheers and then everybody got quiet. It lasts about 90 seconds before, you know, it kicks in the other side and it was gorgeous. That being said, why do we think that, that this just helped us? And why do we think it's a flat earth eclipse? Because the whole country was focused, at least for you know the week leading up to it, focused on the eclipse, meaning they were researching the eclipse and we were expecting everything that they were talking about with the eclipse, all that science and NASA and the universities were talking about the eclipse didn't make any sense. And since you have to be a pretty good three-dimensional thinker to, to figure out some of the nuances of this, and most people aren't, you know, they're, they're not really, including me, I'm not a great three-dimensional thinker. The, 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 the explanations from science about certain things weren't jiving. We were calling them on it all the way up to the eclipse. Meaning, like, for example, uh, uh, the Washington Post ran a fantastic video segment where they actually went to NASA because one of the things was, why is the shadow of the eclipse moving from west to east? That was, that was one of the biggest questions. Like, okay, why is it going west to east when the moon and the sun go east to west? How is that pulling off? And they had their best and brightest trying to explain it in the office, and they were stumped. So they went to NASA, talked to an astrophysicist down at NASA, and he and the graphic he put out there and the explanation was so wrong. I, I was I was half tempted to call him up and say retracted because it was just fraudulent. Meaning he was saying that the moon is actually traveling faster than the earth's rotation and that is and the, and they actually had a graphic that matched up with it some cartoon graphic where the moon is just screaming around the earth i'm going okay one if you know anything you know remember we don't believe in mainstream mainstream science but we have to we have to actually know what it is before you attack it and everyone knows like look it takes you know the 28 days for the moon to complete one cycle around the earth meaning the earth's rotated 28 times that's that's rpms right 28 times around before that earth, that moon gets around there and but the graphic was showing something completely different and and watching these guys bumble through it and this was there it wasn't like they were doing it live this was like a rehearsed and this was the best stuff they had the second part was the the shadow of the moon which was okay <clears throat> tell me how show somebody in a lab show me how you get a 2100 mile object otherwise known as our moon if they if you believe that it's 2500 miles how can you reduce that shadow down to 70 miles that's a 97 percent decrease to show me show <laughs> me a, anything that's a good point that's a good it's like taking a water bottle and shrinking the shadow of it down to the size of a tic tac right how are you doing that you know show me in a lab that you can you can pull that off with with a with an omnidirectional light source and and you know and two other objects show me how you can do that you don't even have to do it in a vacuum show me how you can do that because i'm amazed that that and and the reason why it matches up with us is because we only say that the moon is less than 50 miles in diameter in the first place so to cast a 70 miles wide shadow that's perfect for us that's like yeah that's pretty much it we all know you walk up to a wall your shadow you know when, when, i'm sorry when you walk up you know close to the wall the shadow of you is pretty much it just is, is the smallest is going to get more or less is your size right when you and when you move different d different directions from the light source it stretches out we've all seen long shadows and short shadows but we've never seen microscopic shadows right you, it's it's life size or it's bigger than life, and to to no explanation from NASA. They were just throwing this at it. At, at, you're just coming up with with crap, and people were just like, oh, "Okay, I guess that might work." So we were calling them out on it. The third thing, which is post eclipse, and matter of fact, I'm going to do a show on Tuesday night with a couple guys that did some great photography during this, where they were basically right. taking taking eclipse images and bringing them into Photoshop and tweaking them. And the explanation was really, really interesting and was went straight along what we've been saying all along, which is just like 
the moon is its own adjustable light source, so is the sun. Meaning, if I say that the sun, or say that the moon can create its own waxing and waning crescents because it's just its own independent light source, which is why it can generate cold light, then why wouldn't the sun be as well? The only difference is the sun's just brighter. And up until now, we've, you know, the sun is just the sun. It's always is, you know, it, it rises and sets, but it never gets eclipsed. We've never seen this in our lifetimes or, you know, even our parents' lifetimes. It, you have to go back to your great, you, you know, the, all the way back to 1918 before most of the people even saw anything like this. So the sun is basically self-eclipsing is what we're saying. The, 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 the initial response from the people that were doing the Photoshop analysis were saying, look, it, and it was wrong, but you'll get it when I say it. You're saying nothing is causing the eclipse, meaning and, and that's the wrong way of saying it. What you're saying is there was no three-dimensional object that eclipsed the sun. It's like the sun just darkened itself. And I, oh, I, wow. Yeah. Oh, that, that's actually a really good theory. I had never actually thought about that before. I, I, I had thought about it, but until you see it for yourself, you don't get it. You know, you, you, sometimes you have to, you, you eat, but it, and it's like, of course, of course it does. Because the moon, when it's creating its waxing and waning crescents is just darkening itself. We don't think of the sun darkening itself because it never happens. The sun is always just this giant blinding ball in the sky. It's, it never, it never darkens until last week. And then it did. And it's like, okay, I see what's happening here. So look, the videos are coming. Anyway, so all these things combined what happens is when people look up the eclipse and they will be for a while now there it's it's the the subcon you know the it's being tied or linked to us so it was a huge huge victory for us it, in fact there were a lot of news people if you type in flat earth in the news you know just click on google and news you'll see where it, up until the eclipse people were saying well doesn't the doesn't the eclipse disprove flat earth it's like no 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 I wasn't even remotely worried. And now it's like, now you guys got a huge problem. Most I, I absolutely knew that you were not going to be worried at all. Oh my when, God. When no, talking, no. When I was talking to my co-host Chuck. I was like, this guy is not even going to stumble or stutter for no, a second I, and, when it and, comes and, to the eclipse. And when you see it, you know, when I saw it at the blackout zone and ground zero, when I saw it, I realized I mean, it was, it felt close enough that you could touch it when you're looking at it. You're going, okay, so what this cool, cool, magical thing up there, you're telling me one object is a quarter million miles away. The other one is 93 million miles away. They just happen to intersect at this point, And I'm just going to take your word for it. It's like, no, 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 not, not anymore. It's uh, there were too, <laughs> too many questions. Seriously, if you guys get a chance, not, not just you, but anyone listening, go out and look up the Washington post article that's uh or, you know that's on youtube where you know i i took it and i and i put it on my channel but there's other people that have taken it and it's just i mean watching and these are the brainy types right these are your these are your nerds they couldn't do it they couldn't fit they couldn't explain the eclipse why it's looking the way it does and it's like those if they can't explain it you've already lost your argument so right yeah. anyway well sorry, that's my little thing for for our guests for the ones who are super interested in this topic which i happen to know personally there are a few why don't we go ahead and define a subject that is not as um as within your knowledge zone as the flat earth is and that's the hollow earth which we had talked about uh, a couple of weeks back sure so um for you could you define for us what hollow earth exactly is hollow earth just as a side note was what got me into flat earth in the first place in fact i was a big hollow earth guy for a number of years and what hollow earth if the mainstream i should say the the old conspiracy view of hollow earth was that if it, if this earth is a sphere a ball a globe that it's hollowed out on the inside and that you it's a journey to the center of the earth where people and other civilizations can actually live inside it with alternate energy sources and you know who knows what's down there but and so i was looking at that i i'd been looking at that and and supposedly there was always there was this entrance at the north pole and people were trying to get icebreakers and there was this one famous guy that was trying to schedule an icebreaker and i was actually thinking about going on it and it was years ago and it never it never materialized he ended up dying of cancer mysteriously and 
when I was looking into it, I happened to stumble across um, Richard Bird. Because everybody knows who, who Richard Bird is. If, you, if you're into Hollow Earth, you know this. Which is, he flew a rickety plane up there in 1926. Supposedly flew into the entrance and, uh, you know, saw all this cool stuff when he got down there. Everything was really... I mean, it literally was like a journey to the center of the Earth thing. And what's lesser known is the Charles Lindbergh story. Because Charles Lindbergh was also a big pilot slash explorer slash adventurer. And he went up there with his wife after that supposedly took pictures and we, I don't know if you, you want to believe the story or not but it's an interesting one because he took pictures and then went to the government afterwards and said this is the coolest thing ever the the people are going to love this and the government said yeah we're not telling anybody anything along these lines and he goes why not and he goes well because and he goes look I'm Charles Lindbergh <laughs> you can't tell me what to do I'm a, I'm a hero for God's sakes and Next thing you know, his baby is is kidnapped. The famous Lindbergh baby story. You know, baby dies. No. Yeah, and then after that, the uh, he for whatever reason, he renounces his citizenship in the United States and goes to Europe and never came back. And that was the end of Charles Lindbergh. He just faded into obscurity. So the Hollow Earth theory was very very interesting. I love I love the Hollow Earth theory. In fact, I still believe in the Hollow Earth theory but it changes on a flat model. In fact, when you look at the logistics of a hollow earth theory, on the, it, do, it dovetails extremely well. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, we, 95% of the population of our civilization lives from sea level to about one mile, which is, you know, 50, 5,200, right, yeah. right, right? Absolutely. So it lives in a very, very, we live in a very, very narrow band. So, to have a cave system down below us, you know, to to where they would um, uh, big enough to hold a civilization. Let's say it was even I don't know ten miles high, twenty miles high. That's more than enough of a comfort zone. In fact, let me let me we'll take it back the other way, which is our planes, our commercial aircraft, they cap out at about ten miles. That's about fifty thousand feet, give or take. Spy right. planes. If you believe in them, and I do believe in spy planes, they cap out at about 20 miles. And after that, you know, we'll, we'll say some high, super high altitude balloon, whatever things. Let's say we'll go up a little higher. Let's say 50 miles, right? That's not a, that's not a lot of elevation. I mean, that's a very, very shallow sports stadium. So who's to say, for example, you know, if we're talking about a 50 mile high, you know, I'm not. But let's say you had something as low as a 50 mile high ceiling on this. Who's to say we're not in a hollow earth right now? In fact, we could just <laughs> right? we, we could just as likely be in a hollow earth as, as anything else, like you know, versus underwater, versus under a firmament, whatever it is. It just saying it's easy to do. In fact, once once you realize how little space it takes to create uh, to keep a civilization comfortable in an in an area. I, I'd like to say underground, but again, who knows if we're underground? It, once you realize how little uh, logistically it takes then the, 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 the idea of a giant spherical hollow thing becomes overkill. It's like, yeah, you don't need it. You, you, I, mean, I mean, literally 100 miles would be more than enough for anybody. And in fact, in our world that we're talking about now, our ceiling, we're talking about our ceiling, you know, the, the early estimates, you know, some people would say they're less than 100 miles. I say, you know, I, I look at some of the high altitude atomic testing, going up around 400 miles, 500 miles. Let's say it was even 1,000 miles. That's still really, really shallow. Let's say it's 20,000 miles wide, but only 1,000 miles high. That looks like a sports stadium to me or a planetarium. So there you go. Uh, but I love I love okay. the hollow earth theory. And, uh, so so uh, for our listeners, for the benefit of our listeners, why don't you give... And, and uh, by the way, listeners, just so you know, this is coming from a guy who believes in the uh, flat earth theory, who has spent most of his, as a la and I want to say his, but that would be the wrong connotation, who has spent at least the last two years, if not longer, um, sending out information that um, supports the flat earth theory. So that being said, um, why don't you give us a couple of uh, proofs that would support the whole hollow earth theory and uh, and questions that would arise thereof 
um, supporting okay. this theory. Okay, I got I got one for you. This is and this is one of my favorites, and that is one of the big reasons I believe in the Hollow Earth theory is I believe in older civilizations, meaning we and if this place was constructed, we all know we you know, especially if you follow follow Bible stuff that. There's stories that go back way into antiquity about older civilizations, you know, pre pre flood. Take take your pick. We know there's older civilizations. We're not the first uh, people to rent this apartment by any stretch. Uh, go out and look at the sunken cities off of Japan or the sunken cities off of India or I don't know the Bosnian pyramids or the Bermuda Triangle and Atlantis. There's something down there. Uh, how old are the pyramids? I went up and looked at them myself. They have nothing to do with the people that are living in Cairo now. You look at all those things and you say, okay, what version are we exactly? Are we version seven, six, four? You know, I, I think we're probably more like seven or eight. But if we are version seven or eight, who was version six? Who was version five going all the way back? Right. And where are they now? You know, were they wiped out? I don't think they were wiped out. I think that there were survivors from potentially every era. And once, I, I believe there's protocols put in place here. And, then, and let me mention a couple for you. And that is, uh, if you, we'll, we'll go all the way back to my favorite event. You know, I could, I could say that, yeah, you could go out and buy some night vision binoculars and look up in the sky and you'll see a lot of weird things. The question is, where are they going? Because you don't see them landing. They're always just flying around, flying around, but you don't see them really landing. So are they landing underground? Because I believe there's protocols. The, the greatest UFO sighting of all time wasn't Roswell. It wasn't Aurora, Texas. It wasn't Germany. Well, it was Germany, but it wasn't 1930s Germany. It was the 1561 Nuremberg event, which was the more, you know, over Nuremberg, Germany, 1561, beautiful April morning. Uh, two giant armadas came out and just slugged it out. Just, I mean, flying aircraft carriers just just hammering on each other for a good hour over that city. To where the sketch artists, you can look this up. There's some beautiful sketches online about it. And the only reason it even quit was a third faction showed up with a giant, a single giant black angular ship. And as soon as that ship showed up, the other two scattered. It's like, okay, that raises so many questions, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, one, who are the two that were starting the fight in the first place? Why were they fighting? Uh, what, who was the third faction? Is the third, why is the third faction over them? Were they the cops? Were they the UN? Why the other guys, you know, did, why the other guys take off? The other two didn't bother attacking them, which meant they were technologically either inferior or they were doing something they weren't supposed to. And the bigger question of all for me was how and why was the response time a full hour? They were duking it over one of our cities and yet it took them an hour for them to show up. You throw all those things in the mix and you're talking about a hierarchy, you know, multiple civilizations that are living parallel to us and not necessarily in other dimensions. Yeah, there could be some in other dimensions, but you're more likely to, to go with the easier route, which is they're probably just living right around here with us. Not, yeah, there might be some that look like us and walking the streets, blah, blah, blah. But I think there's protocols that are put in place. And that is once your civilization has its time, you go and do the basement club thing, which means you go into the hollow earth and spend time down there. And you were told not to interfere directly with the natural progression of the system that's up here. And that, that is the, you know, you want the reason for hollow earth, the reason why it, it's, it's viable. That's it. You need a place to put the other civilizations that not, not the current running civilization, but the older ones. And that's, that's what I believe in. So for your for your uh, um, personal opinions, um, which um, information do you think points towards a hollow earth? The the biggest thing for me that points towards a hollow earth is that one would be Admiral Byrd, because I don't think it was a, a complete lie. I don't necessarily believe everything he said in his diary when he went up up there in 1926. But between Admiral Byrd and Charles Lindbergh. Uh, and our limited access to the North Pole, because there's got to be a major entrance up there somewhere. Uh, those would be the, 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 those would be the first ones I'd look at. The other ones I would look at is the fact that our technology can only drill down so far. I don't think we are allowed to drill down to get to a potential hollow earth 
meaning the the, the and I, I throw this at science whenever I can, which is okay. If you believe in mainstream science, if you dug straight down right now, it would take you four thousand miles to get to the center of the Earth, right? We all know this. Eight thousand miles across, four thousand miles to the center. So we, you know, you see all the textbooks with the the red band and the orange band and the yellow and the white. We've seen all the cross sections of that. It's like, wow, those are pretty accurate, right? So when's the deepest probe ever drilled? Is it two thousand miles? Is it a thousand miles? Because you remember, one percent down to the center of the Earth, if you believe in mainstream, is forty miles. Have we drilled down forty miles? Nope. We've drilled down eight. It's the deepest hole ever drilled. No one can drill down past eight, and they tried for years and years and years the germans and the soviets and the americans tried to punch past eight miles you cannot do it the drill bits just turn into mush the heat gets too great there's a magma layer supposedly but they can't they can't do it they cannot get past it no matter where they are you'd think there wouldn't be a magma layer everywhere it's only eight miles it's not that thick but that's the, the i think that's one of the barriers that's involved i think that the uh, the hollow earth is protected by uh, mechanics that are far beyond our technology. Uh, you know, and what I, what I enjoy about this interview that we're doing with you right now is the fact that you're unashamed to talk about a um, topic that contradicts your own personal model. I will say this. For me personally, mm -hmm. it is very hard for me to believe in a flat earth but I will also say this, you have definitely got me thinking to the point when my personal friends, my own friends, ask me what I believe in, especially the guy who um, gave me the questions to ask you, Benny, um, I, it got me to the point where when somebody asks me, do you believe the earth is flat or round? I literally say, hey, you know what? I'm not sure. <laughs> sure. Before I heard this guy, Mark Sargent, and several other people's, but you're definitely the big pusher for sure, which is why I had you on our show in the first place as our first guest. Uh -huh. um, when uh, people, before people had asked me um, what I thought the earth was, I'd be like, yeah, sure, round for sure. That's absolutely indisputable. But then I heard that in first interview with uh, Kiernary Cry Radio, um, oh, where they yeah. had that original interview with you, and then we had you on our show ourselves. I'm at the point now where I'm not going to commit to a flat Earth uh, because I don't want to be a liar and say, <laughs> yeah, man, I definitely believe this. But I will say this, I do not believe the Earth is indefinitely round or a globe myself. Now... Will I pretend to say what I believe it is? No, I'm not. I'm not sure of that. But you definitely have put the globe model in dispute for this said guy right now. <laughs> well, and again, you know, for people that are out there listening to this and rolling their eyes, going, "This jackass is completely out of his mind," <laughs> right? You know, because and I do get that a lot. Although people generally they don't leave me bad messages. It's like, look. I'll, I'll give you the real, real easy version, and that is Shakespeare said that all the world's a stage. And that's really what I'm saying is, is that, look, all the world's a stage, literally, and you're on it. And we all know that, look, the Hollywood sound stages are just giant buildings. That's all we're talking about here. It's just a giant building that you're in that was built by someone or something that is far, far more advanced than us. And the bigger questions, once you can get past the giant building thing, it's like, okay, why are we in it? Is it a, you know, is it a reality show? Is it a terrarium? Is it a planetarium? Are we some box of kittens that needs to be protected from what's outside? Are we a box of scorpions that you should never let out under any circumstances? It could be any one of those things. But you got to get, the, the first thing is you got to you gotta kind of figure out if there's a, for you anyway, if there's a boundary or not. And for me, it's easy. It's like, look, all the world's a stage. Amen to that. Chuck, you got anything? Chuck, you are a chatterbox. Seriously. I know. Man. I know. The guy just can't shut up. I know. It's like, blah, blah, oh. blah. Okay. Well, um, just uh, curious as to, you, know, you you're, you're a Christian and everything like that, but why would God make it as a flat earth as opposed to a globe? I mean, good, qu would, good question. You know, that? I, no, I can 
I can tell you exactly why. Because I've, I've been sent so many models by different people, and I've got this beautiful brass model sure. that was sent by a guy in Australia. And that is, it's the, the reason is, is because, and I'll use a line from uh, Contact with Jodie Foster, and that is, an advanced technology is going to function with a, it's, it's going to have efficiency functioning on multiple levels. The flat model, a flat enclosed system with a dome is so much more efficient than a heliocentric model. You got to remember a globe, well, well, a cool model, you know, oh, it's a sphere, you know, we're all, it, it's aesthetically pleasing to us. A globe cannot survive on its own. A globe needs a sun, other planets, potentially a moon, space, a solar system. It, it needs all these things. It needs this massive, massive support structure. Whereas a flat model with, you know, with a, with a firmament, that's all you need. That's it. The whole thing's just built in. It's, it's a self-contained system, no different than our, our terrariums. The only tricky part is the illusion of space. You know, you basically, if you're born into, which is why I use the village in one of my clues, and that is people believe the world that is presented to them, which the, the village, the movie by M night Shyamalan, brilliant movie in, in my, in, in my opinion, only for the fact that you got to remember that they took children out to a wildlife preserve, built a town from the 1800s and told them they were in the 1800s <laughs> and the kids believed it. Why wouldn't they? Right. If you were born into a giant planetarium that you could not find the edges to, all you could see was up the, you know, the, the stars and everything. If the illusion and, and I'm, I'm, let me get back to your God question. If 99.99999% of the people believe the illusion, you go with the illusion. Meaning if everyone, because people say, well, is there space outside of this? It's like you're holding on to space because you were told there was space for years and years and years. You don't have to have space if you can fake it. If you fake big, you don't build big. Meaning you don't need a solar system if the solar system is already believed to be true. It's, it's just an illusion. Uh, the, um, uh, and human beings, I think, were also genetically designed to believe it. If anyone has any doubt, go to Disneyland. Go to the old ride. Oh, God, it's getting me from the 60s. Pirates of the Caribbean. Not, you know, basically, but all the movies were based off this ride, by the way. If you've ever been there, you get to the very end of that ride. Remember, you're riding these boats. And you get to this harbor. And what's interesting about the harbor is you see a ship firing uh, off in the distance. You see the horizon. Yes. You see the moon. You have no idea how far away that ship is. No. Hey, I just you, I just want to tell you, Mr. Sergeant. Yeah. I've been to Disneyland twice now, and by the way, for all of our listeners, I have been on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Yep. Specifically because of, of this type of interview. Yeah. And I will tell you, it's it's very realistic and very convincing. And I know exactly which scene he's talking about because I just yep. got off of it. Uh, I want to say six weeks ago. And holy cow, he's absolutely right about well, let me, the whole simulation thing. Well, not not just simulation, but perception, which is okay. We all know that when you hold a pen up to your close to your eye, it looks really, really big, right? So, and we all thought this as kids. It's like, is the pen just close to my eye, or is the pen really, really, really big? It's like, well, we know it's a pen, so therefore it's close to your eye. I'm going, okay, that works. But if you hold some sort of generic ball out in the distance. You know, with no wires suspending to where you can tell distances, people have a horrible time at trying to figure out distance. We also have a really, human beings have a really, really bad genetic flaw. Well, it's not, an, I'd say it was engineered into us of determining relative motion, which is, and we've all done this. You're in, a, in stop and go traffic and you, you zone out for a second. And then all of a sudden the car next to you starts moving backwards, right? Or moving forwards. You're going, okay, did I take my foot off the brake? Is my foot on the wrong pedal? What the hell's happening? You don't know. You freak out for a little bit. And the only, and the reason you're, everybody does this. And the reason is because we don't, we can't tell relative motion. We see that if a train, if we're on trains and another train is going past you or planes, or if you're on an escalator and you're looking stuff weird, we can't tell relative motion. So when you see the stars and why, why does this matter, right? When you see the stars moving above you, that's when you got to ask yourself the question, are the stars moving or is the earth moving? Because as human beings, we are, we genetically can't tell the difference. So you only have, you have to rely on mainstream science. They say, well, no, no, the earth is moving. The stars aren't moving. It's like, oh, really? Cause in a planetarium, the stars are moving. 
and it looks exactly the same. <laughs> so what are we talking about? Anyway, I could go on and on, but you you got to get what I'm what I'm saying here. So anyway, I'm sorry. Back to your thing, Chuck. It is extremely efficient. If it is it is way more efficient in a flat model than uh, than a globe model because it's self-contained and it's uh, it, ev everything flows perfectly. It's 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 a terrarium system, and we've seen these in little um, terrariums that you can buy. You know where you don't even have to add water. You know, and, and the system just keeps perpetuating itself. Imagine that, but twenty thousand miles wide. Hey man. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Well, uh, anything else you would want to add to that, Chuck? Uh, not really. At the moment, I can't think of anything else, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm talking so much. <laughs> <laughs> anything nice. else you want to add to that, Mr. Sergeant? Uh, no, just it's going gonna, it's gonna to ramping up to be a great end of the year. We, you know, we still have the national conference coming up in November in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is going to be shot by multiple documentary teams and uh i'm gonna be going down well we'll see now that houston's being flooded i was scheduled to go down in houston to houston and visit nasa with uh with some people and shoot that as part of his documentary on the 10th but we'll see if everything's still open down there by the time i get there because it'll be two weeks from today i hope they can clean up in two weeks yeah, yeah, right. Unfortunately, it's Houston that has the problem now. Unfortunately, not not the disparate the people who are going through a lot of stuff right now because of the flooding. But wow. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate you for your time, sir. And thank, you. Uh, thank yeah, thank you. Or you're welcome, and thank you for coming on our show. We really appreciate you. As um, yeah, we uh, we definitely. We, we consider you a friend of the show because you were the first person that we ever interviewed and you have come with on, come on twice. And I hope when you listen to this interview, you will notice the difference in the production quality <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and just the we way that what? we do the show. What, cool. Chuck? We have what? <laughs> oh, okay. So thank you Very for your cool. time. And I've already got, by the way, for you guys listening, I want you to go to our show notes because I have uh, Mark Sargent's, um, he, both his websites on there, his, uh, his book, which he definitely wrote a book named Flat Earth Clues. We've got that on there. You can purchase it on Amazon.com. And we also have his YouTube channel on there as well. So please go check that out because it's got Flat Earth Clues on there, which his book was um, inspired from. So please go on there.